Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 14th of the third month, the day before Shavuot. And we, which happens to line up with the 27th of May on the Gregorian calendar for 2023. And we are taking a segue again from our finishing the book of Hanok or the book of First Enoch, as it's called, to cover what we know to be in the word in regard to tomorrow, the 15th of the third month, or the day where every covenant was ratified. As we will see, the Torah was given the rebirth of his body or the birthing again of the renewed covenant and the giving of the Ruach and also what we possibly believe to be the birth of our Mashiach all happening on this day. So I'm willing that this will be edifying for everyone and we can all grow and learn from it. Please feel free to add what you might find elsewhere in scripture. This is not exhaustive. You have references to Shavuot in the Kings and Chronicles, in Ezra at the return, in other references. We're going to be covering mostly the book of Yobelim just because it has a interesting connection that we might not always see so without further ado we'll go ahead and get started this first section is from Yikra or leviticus chapter 23 which we most of us are familiar with but we're going to start on verse 9 and it says and yahuwah spake unto moshe saying speak unto the children of yisrael and say unto them when you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the Kohen. And this would be the, the barley, right? The first one. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Yahuwah to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the Kohen shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf an he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahuwah. And the meat offering thereof, two tenths deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah, a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof of wine, the fourth of a hin, and you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day that you have brought an offering unto your Elohim, a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Meaning they were not to eat the produce of the land for that year until after they offered it to our Maker. And that was the Abi barley harvest, if you will. The first fruits, right? Which you know the reason why they had that? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. It's on could the. Could you 20th. explain the reason? Could, yeah, could you explain the reason why they couldn't or uh, shouldn't? Well, it was ordained from above, firstly, and what he wills is what we should do. But the the intent there, just like with the growing of trees, there's instructions on for how to do it. For the first four years, they're uncircumcised. In the fifth year, or I'm sorry, in the first three years, they're uncircumcised and the fruit's not to be eaten. In the fourth year, it's Kadosh Lo Yahuwah, or set apart for him. And then in the fifth, you can have what you will and do, do what you will with it. Um, There's parables in there there's types and things being taught for all of these things and those are something we can go into more at other times but the intent here is because that's how he established it and the idea is that before we eat before we offer before we do anything we should be grateful rejoice and praise our maker and when you want to partake of the fruits of the earth or even to partake of your day that there's evidence in the scriptures, in the apostolic constitutions and the other writings that it's to our benefit 
to acknowledge him and to thank him and to show him the the preference in everything, to give him the first of our offerings, to give him the first of the things that he's given to us in return, a tenth of all, if you will, which the tenth letter is the yod, which is the, the tithe, his portion, which is the work of his hands, which is everybody who's like clay and he's the, the potter and they're formed into the vessel that he so chooses for them. Again, parables and pictures, but it's all to show the same thing, right? So part of that tenth or the representation of it, which was like what Yaakov made the vow to do, is the first fruits and the tithing of all your stuff. A tenth of all, right? Or the first fruits, it's a picture of our Mashiach. It's a picture of a rehearsal of these events again, which we're kind of covering um, the Abib barley harvest was the exodus. It's it's alluded to at that time. The wheat harvest that we're going to read about here was the renewed covenant, and that was it, that's elucidated, elucidated, and um, alluded to quite well. The connection is made very clear in the apostolic constitutions, but even in the in the common scriptures, in the epistles and the writings of the emissaries. So, um, right here. Now, there's a lot more. I mean, we could spend all day just going into the nuances of what you can find here. All these offerings, the different types, what they were, how they were offered, the measured amounts. These are all types and pictures. If you remember, every offering was to represent our Mashiach. His believers are his body. Everyone that was perfected would be like him. And all the martyrs were those that were made perfect in the truth. And they died just like the truth was being killed at that time. So you, you have a lot more that you can look at here that we're not covering. I'm sorry for that, but there's literally the many fold wisdom of Elohim cannot be contained or, or expounded on by one in one setting it, with any sufficiency forever to, to ever do it justice but we're going to do the best we can. And anyone that knows more about these things or can see them clearly, please feel free to share them because this isn't exclusive information to me or to the group that we're in. This is pretty much what you can find if you just read and believe what he said. <clears throat> this is, and you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the sale, the self saved day that you have brought an offering unto your Elohim, a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahuwah. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals or meal, fine flour, right? So this is two loaves of wheat bread, okay? They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon, bacon with leaven, the first fruits unto Yahuwah. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering unto Yahuwah with their meat offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto Yahuwah. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of shalom offerings. And the Kohen shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits, a wave offering before Yahuwah. With the two lambs, they shall be set apart to Yahuwah for the Kohen. And you shall proclaim on the selfsame day, it may be a set apart convocation or a set apart gathering congregation unto you you shall do no servile work therein meaning you don't work for money all right M making your own food 
cooking a meal is permissible, unlike on Shabbat, where you should prepare your food beforehand, right? Warming it up, there's a difference, but not cooking, okay? You can make your meal on Shavuot. A statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not make clean riddance of the corners of the, your field. When you reap, neither shall you gather any gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. All right. Now, this is a type in parable. You see first of the Exodus with the barley and the offering unto the Yahuwah, and then the countings, the times, the, the gestation period, if you will, to the wave offering. So this is a bee barley, or the barley in its grain state, and this is two completed full bread, where the harvest is full, it was gathered in and made into one body, right? And those are all types and pictures, what the wheat represents, what all these things is, what the seed represents, being fruitful so um ob willing that is able to be seen and then in just a moment we're going to go and start covering the other significant events that happened in this time or particularly on this day throughout history right. so starting with yobelim chapter one and we're not going to read too much right here but i wanted to let you see that this came to pass in the first year of the exodus of the children of Israel out of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, in the third month, on the 16th day of the month. All right. And that was when he started getting the book of Yobelim recited to him. The day before is when our Mashiach, Yahuwah of esteem, was on Mount Sinai in the burning fire and speaking audibly to the people. He gave them the Ten Commandments and the right rulings, and then they said, please no more. Let us not hear him anymore, at least we die. This is the very next day after that. Okay, 2000. That should actually say um, 2,410. So that's a little bit off. But... um. 2,410 years from creation on the 16th of the third month, the day after Shavuot. All right, so now this established that Shavuot was when he gave the covenant. That's important for a later time when we get to uh, these other events that are going on. So just one moment. All right, so Ab willing, you can see the pointer very well. Just to cover what was mentioned, this is the first after the Shabbat, right? This festival is completely finished before the next one is mentioned. This is something that you don't see so clearly just within the common scriptures. But when you look at the totality of what is written, especially what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then you, it makes it unequivocal that the calendar can't be any other way. And then when you line this up with all the events that are in Scripture, it lines up perfectly with how things are set up. And even this right here is a parable of history, which we've covered before. So just within the creation week, you can line that up with his passion week, and you can see how there is a parable. When he came and died the third day, so after 2,000 years, it was 2,410 when he delivered them. And then it was 2,888 years or so at the fourth or second year, or the fourth year of Shalomo's reign when he first started building the Hekel. So after the, the fullness and the Hekel was being made and the covenant was being fully fulfilled, then it was broken. And that was at the end of the third day, just like the Pesach lamb was offered at the end of the third day. And then he came preaching his death until he came, which represents the sun moon and stars or the light of the world what was already revealed to us the malkuth shamayim or the moon was like the kingdom of the shamayim 
and then the stars are the children of light running the course set before them. And the truth, being buried and dead for one, two, three days, after this day, before dawn on the millennial reign or Sabbath, he rises from the dead, and his bride is made prepared and made ready and spotless before he returns, if you recall. So you can't have that without the truth coming before. Anyways, it all fits the same pattern that history actually walks out. The more you see this, the easier it is to trust it and that you won't be led astray by errant opinions and things that just aren't true and proven with the scriptures ad nauseum, right? Or ad nauseum, redundantly. But sorry about that. Point being, after this festival of unleavened bread, then you start the festival of first fruits. And if you count that, it, you count the 50 days, the 15th of the third month will always be after the seventh Sabbath, right here. But that's not possible to happen if you start this during unleavened bread. Like right here, it would be a week off. So that's another confirmation of the calendar. Either way, I wanted to show this for anyone who needs the visual representation. If you give us just one moment, we'll get back onto the next references for the 15th of the third month. All right, so right here, we are on chapter three of the book of Yobelim. And this is after Adam and all things are created. He's named all the animals in the second week. Hua or Eve. His wife or woman was made from him. And then after they're set apart times, 40 days for him, 80 days for Hua, they were brought into the Garden of Eden. From that time, for seven years, they were obedient and kept the truth that was given to them, and they had no more problems in the Garden. After seven years, on the 17th day, of the second month, the serpent beguiled Hua or caught and enticed her into sinning, and then Adam also sinned. So from the 17th day of the second month, all the way to the time they were kicked out, which is what we're trying to cover, certain things took place. Now right here, you can see this is... After the completion of seven years, when he had completed seven years exactly, in the second month on the 17th day, the serpent came and approached the woman. So that was when the sin happened in the Garden of, Hu of Eden, right? This is also, if you remember, the 17th of the second month is the day that the flood started. But this is later, later on in history from this point. So... From that time until the day that they were kicked out of the of the garden right here, you have oh just one moment. All right, so you can see from the seventeenth day of the second month until they were kicked out was the new month of the fourth month. All right. So you had all of the, the rest of the second month and all of the third month that the events here took place where they realized they were naked. They covered themselves with fig tree or fig leaves, which the, the word for fig leaves in Hebrew is also the, the word that means excuses. Okay. And then from there, Yahuwah questions the man. He question then he curses them the the whole thing that goes through there and he made a coat of skin for them and clothed them and sent them forth from the garden all right i can't prove this we don't have any evidence of it but i believe that the coats of skin or that first sacrificed animal would have been on the 15th of the third month and they would have been sent forth after that time which was on the first of the fourth month there is no 
no hard empirical evidence for this, but when you look at all these other things for when every covenant was ratified, for when our Mashiach, his body was born again, and the different pictures here, it, it it's rather fitting. So the first atonement or the first covering for them was the 15th of the third month, possibly with the coat of skin for Adam and Hua. Again, that's not definitive, but that's this is what I found. If you have other evidence, either for or against that, please don't hesitate to share. And if you give me one moment, we'll find the next reference here. All right, so our next reference is in Yobelim, or Jubilees, chapter 6, when Noah went forth from the ark and made atonement. And this is on the new month of the third month, he went forth from the ark and built an altar on that mountain. And he made atonement for the earth and took a kid and made atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth, for everything that had been on it had been destroyed, save those that were in the ark with Noah. And he placed the fat thereof on the altar and he took an ox and a goat and a sheep and kids and salt and a turtle dove and the young of a dove and placed a burnt sacrifice on the altar, and poured thereon an offering mingled with oil, and sprinkled wine, and strewed frankincense over everything, and caused a goodly savor to arise acceptable before Yahuwah. And Yahuwah smelt the goodly savor, and he made a covenant with him, that there should not be any more a flood to destroy the earth, that all the days of the earth, seed time and harvest, should never cease, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night should not change their order, nor cease forever. And you increase you and multiply upon the earth, and become many upon it, and be a baraka upon it, the fear of you and the dread of you I will inspire in everything that is on earth and in the sea. And behold, I have given unto you all beasts and all winged things and everything that moves on the earth and the fish in the waters and all things for food. As the green herbs, I have given you all things to eat. But flesh with the soul, the nephesh thereof, with the blood you shall not eat, for the life of all flesh is in the blood, lest your blood for your souls be required. At the hand of every man, at the hand of every beast, will I require the blood of man. This is the importance of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? As a man does, so it will be done unto you. Whoever, for whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of Yahuwah made he man. Okay, that's the covenant. This all right here is the word, the covenant that he made, the promise that he will not break to Noah and his children, right? And it says, and Noah and his sons swore that they would not eat any blood that was in any flesh. And he made a covenant before Yahuwah forever throughout all the generations of the earth in this month. And on this account, he spoke to you that you should make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain with an oath. The thing that he would have done literally the day before he's speaking to Moshe on the mountain for the beginning of the book of Yobelim, where he's recounting all this information, right? This oath or this covenant that Noah made right here was a representation. And re the reason why this one was made right here, which means we know that this first one was also the 15th of the third month. And from this being a blood sacrifice of animals, we can go back to the first covering with animals that happened during the same time period, which was the premise that I was trying to mention at first, okay? <clears throat> 
But it says, on this account, he spoke to you that you should make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain with an oath, and that you should sprinkle blood thereupon or upon them because of all the words of the covenant which Yahuwah made with them forever. And this testimony is written concerning you that you should observe it continually so that you should not eat on any day any blood of beasts or birds or cattle during all the days of the earth. And the man who eats the blood of beast or of cattle or of birds during all the days of the earth, he and his seed shall be rooted out of the land. And do you command the children of Israel to eat no blood, so that their names and their seed may be before Yahuwah our King or our Elohim continually. For this Torah there is no limit of days, for it is forever. They shall observe it throughout their generations, so that they may continue supplicating on your behalf with blood before the altar every day at the time of morning and evening, they shall seek forgiveness on your behalf perpetually before Yahuwah, that they may keep it and not be rooted out. This mention of per perpetuity or perpetually morning and evening offerings is another witness to the to the definition of what's meant by Dan in Daniel, where it talks about the 2300 mornings and evenings or the continual that was put to that was stopped at that time. It represents the three and a half years where Antiochus Epiphans had came in and stopped the morning and evening offerings, which is what's being alluded to right here. They were called that which is perpetual or continual, right? And he gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not again be a flood on the earth. He set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant, that there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth. And he's been true to his covenant. There has never been another flood and there never will be. The next time there's an entire destruction of all things, it will be through fire. And that's going to be after the millennial reign. It says, for this reason, it is ordained and written on the Shamayim tablets that they should celebrate the Feast of Weeks in this month once a year to renew the covenant every year. And the renewal of the covenant is what's supposed to be done perpetually tomorrow, right? Just like they renewed the covenant for themselves when they were reciting the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And it was the renewed covenant for the body of believers when they were all together with one mind in Yerushalayim after his death and resurrection. Okay? It says, And this whole festival was celebrated in Shamayim from the day of creation till the days of Noah, 26 Yobelim, and five weeks of years, 1309 to 1659 Aniomundi or from creation. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven Yobelim and one week of years, or 350 years, till the day of Noah's death. And from the day of Noah's death, his sons did away with it until the days of Abraham, and they ate blood. So you see, they kept the truth, and they were partakers of the everlasting covenant for the entirety of Noah's life. But after he died, his sons turned away from keeping the feasts. They ate blood, and they were outside of the covenant of our Creator. Anyone who professes to be a believer and does not keep his festivals like every believer that ever existed is in that same situation. So I wouldn't recommend doing that anymore. But Abraham observed it, and Yitzhak and Yaakov and his children observed it up to your days. And in your days the children of Israel forgot it until you celebrated it anew on this mountain. 
And do you command the children of Israel to observe this festival in all their generations for a commandment unto them? One day in the year, in this month, they shall observe or they shall celebrate the festival. For it is the feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits. This feast is twofold and of a double nature according to what is written and engraved concerning it. Celebrate it. Remember, twofold and of a double nature, the abib, barley, grain, and then the wheat harvest after the counting, the exodus from Egypt unto the renewed covenant in foretelling or in the way it's in parables. Okay? For I have written in the book of the first Torah, in that which I have written for you, that you should celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. And I explained to you its sacrifices that the children of Yisrael should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this month, one day in every year. And on the new month of the first month, and on the new month, oh, well, then this goes into the days of remembrance, other feast days that we're also to keep, but that's not, um, that's not what we're covering today. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. But as you can see, the covenant made with Noah, the rainbow covenant, the, was established because of what was done beforehand. And it was kept by those that were partakers of the eternal covenant those that were of the body of our Mashiach. And after Noah's death, people turned away until Abraham kept it. And he and his seed that did so were found acceptable before our maker with belief leading to obedience, right? So just one moment, we'll find the next reference here of the 15th of the third month. All right, so you have from the time of Noah and his keeping of this festival, a remembrance of the covenant that he made, the Rainbow Covenant, for 350 years until his death at 950 years old. After that, his children went apostate, and they did not keep the eternal covenant. They went further and ate blood, or the soul, with the meat. They also shed man's blood did things that they were not meant to and and allowed satan to have jurisdiction over them through their willing evil basically through all those things and our mashiach being a righteous judge it was not until the time of abraham that you have men repent and start keeping these festivals again abram started by keeping the the festivals of the seventh month first and he reinstituted these in different times throughout his life and then kept them perpetually as a remembrance that he passed on to his children, which is really what you the culmination of what you see throughout the book of Yo Belim is the foundation of the festivals, the rehearsals of what it represented, the foreshadowings in parable with the patriarchs and what they walk out of all history. And then, you know, what was passed on as an inheritance to us, the, the truth of these things which is really amazing. But right here, Yobelim chapter 14, it says, After these things in the fourth year of this week, on the new month of the third month, the word of Yahuwah, our Mashiach, came to Abram in a dream, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your defender, and your reward will be exceeding great. And he said, Yahuwah Elohim, what will you give me, seeing I go hence childless? And the son of Mesek, the son of my handmaid, is the Damascus, or the Eliezer of Damascus. He will be my heir, and to me you have given no seed. And he said to him, This man will not be your heir but one that will come out of your own bowels, he will be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said to him, 
look towards Shemaim and sefer or number the stars if you are able to number them. That word sefer means to recount, renumber, to record in a book, right? To book them. But to number the stars or to record the stars if you're able to record them. And he looked towards Shemaim and beheld the stars. And he said to him, so shall your seed be. And he believed in Yahuwah, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahuwah that brought you out of Ur of the Kazdim, to give you the land of the Canaanim to possess it forever. And I will be king unto you, or Elohim unto you, and to your seed after you. And he said, Yahuwah Elohim, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, Take me a heifer of three years. The, the three patriarchs of the covenant, right? A goat of three years, and a sheep of three years, and a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And he took the turtle dove and the pigeon are the, the remnant, the, the little flock, okay, the innocent one that doesn't lift violence against any. The, the flees like a bird to the mountains. There's a picture in all these things if you pay attention, okay? And he took all these in the middle of the month, the 15th of the third month, and he dwelt at the Oak of Mamre, the same place where he offered his son, right? Which is near Hebron. And he built there an altar and sacrificed all these. And he poured their blood upon the altar and divided them in the midst and laid them over against each other, but the birds divided he not. And the birds came down upon the pieces, and Abraham drove them away, and did not suffer the birds to touch them. And it came to pass, when the sun had set, that an ecstasy, or a terror, fell upon Abram. And behold, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And it was said to Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be stranger in a land not theirs, and they shall bring them into bondage and afflict them four hundred years. Now, this is construed to mean that they were in Egypt for four hundred years. But when you look at the whole body of evidence of what of everything that's mentioned, all right, they're strangers in the land and sojourners since the time in Canaan. And after this, if you recall, when he weaned Yitzhak was about four, 400 years before the Exodus, which is knowing that his seed would be a stranger in the land not theirs and shall be brought into bondage. In the common scriptures, it mentions that they were in bondage and sojourning in the land of Egypt for 430 years. But in the Samaritan Pentateuch, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the book of Yahusuf or Josephus, and um, it might be mentioned elsewhere, it specifically says that they would be sojourning and afflicted or oppressed for 430 years, both in Egypt or Mitzrayim and Canaan, which actually lines up with everything that we can read. That 430 year promise or covenant that was mentioned 30 years before Yitzhak was weaned. And if you remember, he was weaned at five years old, which was 400 years before the Exodus. And when he was first afflicted or oppressed, when he was made fun of or mocked by his older brother, Yishmael. So this, all of that information is explained very well by a brother in the belief. His name is Nathan. I believe he has a YouTube channel with two videos on him. How long were the Israelites in, in Egypt? And were the pyramids built before the flood? Very well put together. I highly recommend that you check him out. I'll put him in the description. But back on point here. And it says, and the nation also to whom they will be in bondage in Mitzrayim 
will I judge. And after that, they shall come forth thence with much substance. And you shall go to your fathers in Shalom and be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the inequity of the Amorites is not yet full. So fourth generation, if you look, Jacob went into the land. Louis was born of Jacob, first generation who went into the land, right? Kohath was born of him. Amram was born of him. And then you have, that's three, the fourth generation from Amram would have been Miriam, Aharon, and Moshe, which was the generation that returned there, right? Or all but two, right? Oh, they were they were taken out, and then their children returned into the land. This is, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the inequity of the Amorites is not yet full. And he awoke from his sleep, and he arose, and the sun had set, and there was a flame, and behold, a furnace was smoking, and a flame of fire passed between the pieces. And in the common scriptures, it says there was a flame, and there was a, there was a, uh, like a smoking brand or a flame, and then a burning furnace, and both passed through the pieces. Neither one that passed through to make and ratify that covenant was Abram, though. That was our Mashiach making a covenant for Abram's benefit with his own father that he kept right but here this is what it has to say and this is the covenant again when that word was birthed in the world and on that day yahuwah made a covenant with abram saying to your seed will i give this land from the river of mitzrayim unto the great river the river euphrates the Canaanim and the Kenzanim and the Kadmonites and the Pezerites and the Raphaim and the Thakarites and the Huites or the Hivites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Yebusites. And the day passed, and Abram offered the pieces and the birds and their fruit offerings and their drink offerings, and the fire devoured them. And on that day, we made a covenant, meaning the messenger of the presence, our Mashiach, who's speaking, and the Father, right? On that day, we made a covenant with Abram, according as we had covenanted with Noah in this month. And Abram renewed the festival and ordinance for himself forever. And Abram rejoiced and made all these things known to Sarai, his wife. And he believed that he would have seed, but she did not bear. All right. Now, the events that transpire, we're aware of, but we're going to go ahead and skip reading further because we want to cover specifically what happens tomorrow throughout history. So just one moment. We'll find it again. All right. This is the next reference in Yobelim chapter 15. And just for context, after that last reference, when he first made that covenant with Abram, the promise that his seed would be like the stars of the Shemaim, he believed, but his wife didn't bear, and she was impatient. So she recommended that he would take Hagar, her female servant, for wife, or a concubine, and raise up seed through her, which he did and had his first son, Yishmael. He's explained, or rather his mother, Hagar, is explained by Shaul as representing and foretelling the first covenant in Sinai of Arabia. And that would make Yishmael, or he who hears, believes, and does that of El, to be the first covenant believers, or those born of that first covenant. That helps to explain the parables in relation to Yitzhak and um, Edom, or I'm sorry, Yitzhak and Yishmael, right? The promised seed and the first covenant believers, and then the 
the renewed or those of the promised seed, the renewed covenant believers. It also helps to differentiate the next set down when you have Jacob, the, the one who has what he does returned at the heel of what he's doing, rewarded for his behavior, and Edom, the one born in the womb with him who rose up and hated his brother from his heart and broke his word that in his, uh, his vow that he made with his father. That happens to line up with Roman Catholicism, right? Who, while the overseers in the assembly of Rome was born at the same time with the other believers, they turned against them, hated them from the heart, and broke their word to persecute for a very long time. So, back on point. You can see right here, after that, Yishmael was born, the events that transpired from there, and then you had the keeping or the giving of the circumcision to him. So after he was given the circumcision, it says, and in the fifth year of the fourth week of this Yobel, or 1979 Aniomundi from creation, okay? In the third month, in the middle of the month, Abram celebrated the feast of the first fruits of the grain harvest. Okay? So that would have been what we call Shavuot, the very covenant that he had just made with him that he was remembering. And he offered new offerings on the altar, the first fruits of the produce unto Yahuwah, an heifer and a goat and a sheep on the altar as a burnt sacrifice unto Yahuwah. Their fruit offerings and their drink offerings he offered upon the altar with frankincense. And Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Yahuwah Elohim. Approve yourself before me and be you perfect. In Bereshit or Genesis, it says, when he appeared here, it says, I am Yahuwah El Shaddai. Walk before me and be you perfect, right? <clears throat> And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and Yahuwah talked with him and said, Behold, my ordinance is with you, and you shall be the father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your name from henceforth even forever shall be Abraham. For the father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you very great, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come forth from you. And I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you throughout their generations for an eternal covenant, so that I may be an Elohim to you and to your seed after you. And the land where you have been a sojourner the land of Canaan, that you may possess it forever, and I will be their king, or I will be their Elohim. Sorry, this particular translation continually will put sovereign ruler in the place of Elohim. So I, I just try to correct it. And Yahuwah said to Abraham, As for you, and as for you, do you keep my covenant, you and your seed after you? and circumcise you every male among you, and circumcise your foreskins, and it shall be a token of an eternal covenant between me and you. And the child on the eighth day you shall circumcise every male throughout your generations. Him that is born in the house, or whom you have brought with money from any stranger, whom you have acquired who is not of your seed. He that is born in your house shall surely be circumcised, and those whom you have bought with money shall be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an eternal ordinance. And the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin on the eighth day, that soul or inner being shall be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. Now, the parable in this, 
And the reason why we are not to be offering sacrifices of our foreskins today anymore, physically, literally, is because it was not enjoined. But the uh, we were told not to by Shaul specifically. It was foretold to be put an end to by Ezra 400 years before then. It was alluded to in foretelling that it would be a, a time where it was done away with all the way back in the wilderness journey with Yahushua when he brought them into the land after the wilderness journey. And then they made their offering with their circumcision. All right. All of that was a foreshadowing of these facts. But more to the point, the eighth day represents after the creation week, after the millennial reign, after Satan is released for a time, and you have the renewed creation where there's no more sin, no more evil, no more unrighteousness, no more death. And that is the eighth day covenant man in which you must be circumcised to be his. So if you can see that, all of these things start making more sense too, and you won't be so dogmatic um, about certain things. A lot of people are very contentious about circumcision or other aspects of the Torah because we don't have the full picture of what he's trying to share. But the idea that our creator can change his word is in scripture. It's unequivocal. The circumcision itself is a very fact of that. There was none to begin with. He established it in time. He, It was removed and then restored. And it was foretold to be removed and it will be restored again in a fuller sense, like you can see right here with the eighth day. And that's that eighth day illusion that you also can find in a few places in scripture, including the epistle of Barnabas. Okay. It's that forever after, after there's no more tears and a new creation. But okay. Back on track. Can I, can I make a statement here? Certainly brother. Go ahead. Uh, I gave some thought to this. This is and I mean, we are we have been engineered. Our our entire body was created and engineered by a perfect engineer. And if there is any part of our body that is totally useless, it was that foreskin. <laughs> it's perfect. It works out wonderful. Yeah. I'm done. All right. Thank you, brother. I know I've seen a few things on studies about that, too. And that's what I was saying. There's literally you can find pretty much any aspect in Scripture, any law, any enjoined statute. And if it doesn't have an overt application towards the benefit of a man, like do not lie, do not steal, do not deceive one another. Right. It has an inference where it's teaching you through a parable or an illusion that the wisdom of Elohim is making known to a man who is in his image. It's not meant for an animal to get these things, right? Yeah. All right, so real quick, back on verse 15, it says, And Yahuwah said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, her name shall no more be called Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And Sar is prince. So Sarah is princess, right? Sarah, and I will barak her and give you a son by her, and I will barak him, and he shall become a nation, and kings of nations shall proceed from him. These are the covenants that were being given, just so you know, perpetual, never to be broken covenants. And this is why we can rest assured that all the monarchs of the world, just about. Are, if they're not directly of the male line of Yahuda, they were intermarried from him and from him specifically of the seed of Dawid or David. All the kings of the earth, all the kings over his children are from, including the, all the presidents of the United States. And this again was foreshadowed in the monarchy being given to Yahuda and the line of Dawid in the land. And then the perpetual covenants given to them, as we read here, and as you can see in the covenants in the common scriptures to them specifically. And then also, um, oh, I forgot where I was going with that, sorry. But, oh, and after the return, when they went into the captivity and then they returned from it, 
you had the monarchy taken away from the sons of Dawid, and they came back as a governor. And in the same way, after the Babylonian captivity, the mystery Babylon during the Dark Ages of the Inquisitions, once you had the Reformation, then you had the change of for popular government spread throughout the, the seat of Abraham. And while there's still a monarchical form of government over some of the children of Israel, as it was foretold that there would always be someone on the throne for the seat of Dawid, that is perpetual in like england they were presidents and things in america and you can find these illusions are what the patriarchs walk out in different forms so back on track and th that's another reason why all the kings or sorry all the presidents of the united states are related to each other they all come from the same families which come from the the lines that were given by our creator through covenant to reign over people whether they do good or ill, they're going to be judged for it, however. And Abraham fell on his face and rejoiced and said in his heart, Shall a son be born to him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bring forth? And Abram, or sorry, Abraham said to Yahuwah, O oh, that Yishmael might live before you, or Yishmael, right? And Yahuwah said, Yes, and Sarah also shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Yitzach, and I will establish my covenant with him, an everlasting covenant, and for his seed after him. And as for Yishmael, also have I heard you. The first, Think of first covenant believers and the benefits they were given, right? And behold, I will barak him and make him great and multiply him exceedingly, and he shall begat twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Yitzach, whom Sarah shall bear to you in these days, in the next year. So, 15th of the third month, Yahuwah appeared to him promised seed or promised gave a word that a son would be promised to be born to him in these days 15th of the third month next year and he left off speaking with him and yahuwah went up from abraham no one's gone up or come down but the son of adam right and abraham did according as yahuwah had said to him and he took yishmael or yishmael his son and all that were born in his house and whom he had brought or bought with money every male in his house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin. And on the self same day was Abraham circumcised, and all the men of his house and all those whom he had brought with money from the children of the stranger were circumcised with him. This Torah is for all the generations forever, and there is no circumcision of these days and no admission of one day out of the eight days, for it is an eternal ordinance ordained and written on the Shamayim tablets. And every one that is born, the flesh of whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongs not to the children of the covenant which Yahuwah made with Abraham, but to the children of destruction. Nor is there, moreover, any sign on him that he is Yahuwah's, but to be destroyed and slain from the earth and to be rooted out of the earth for he has broken the covenant of Yahuwah our Elohim. For all the messengers of the presence and all the messengers of set apartness have been so created from the day of their creation. And we're going to be like the messengers, right? And before the messengers of the presence and the messengers of set apartness, he had set apart Yisrael, that they should be with him and with his set apart messengers. And do you command the children of Yisrael and let them observe the sign of this covenant for their generations as an eternal ordinance, and they will not be rooted out of the land. For the command is ordained for a covenant that they should observe it forever among all the children of Yisrael. For Yishmael and his sons and his brothers and Esau 
Yahuwah did not cause to approach him. And he chose them not because they are the children of Abraham, because he knew them. Just like our Mashiach didn't make himself known to all men because he knew them. He knew what was in their hearts. Right? But he chose Yisrael to be his people. And he set him apart, or and he set apart it, and gathered it from amongst all the children of men. For there are many nations and many peoples, and all are his. And over all has he placed Ruachoth, or spirits, in authority to lead them astray from him. But over Yisrael he did not appoint any messenger or Ruach, for he alone is their ruler. Our Mashiach is our king, right? And he will preserve them and require them at the hand of his messengers and his Ruachoth, or spirits, and at the hand of all his powers, in order that he may preserve them and barak them, and that they may be his and he may be theirs from henceforth forever. And now I announce unto you that the children of Israel will not keep true to this ordinance, and they will not circumcise their sons according to all this Torah. So again, it was foretold right here that it would happen, meaning that it, it had to happen, right? Because it was foreordained. I'm not saying it's right not to do things that he said to, but I'm saying there are times where we're not supposed to do things that he said, and there are times where you are supposed to do the things that he said. Another perfect example we just covered earlier, it said, when you come into the land, then you do these things. Before they came into the land, they were not required to give the first fruits of their produce because they weren't growing anything. And on the same venue, everyone that doesn't grow barley is not required to offer the first fruits of it because that's not a resource they have. Back on track here, it says, For in the flesh of their circumcision, they will omit this circumcision of their sons, and all of them, sons of Belial, will leave their sons uncircumcised as they were born. And there will be great wrath from Yahuwah against the children of Yisrael, because they have forsaken his covenant and turned aside from his word and provoked and blasphemed inasmuch as they do not observe the ordinance of this Torah. For they have treated their members like the Gentiles so that they may be removed and rooted out of the land and there will no, no more be pardon nor forgiveness unto them so that there should be forgiveness and pardon for all the sin of this eternal error. All right, and we're going to go ahead and keep on. I, I'm going to read through the whole next section because it covers, it ties right into it with the 15th of the third month being when the promised seed to Abraham was fulfilled in creation, a type and picture of the birth of the promised seed in creation with our Mashiach when he was literally born and also when the renewed covenant was born, his body, right? So it says, and on the new month of the fourth month, we appeared unto Abraham at the Oak of Mamre and we talked with him and we announced to him that a son would be given to him by Sarah, his wife. And Sarah laughed, for she heard that we had spoken these words with Abraham, and we admonished her, and she became afraid, and denied that she had laughed on account of the words. And we told her the name of her son, as his name is ordained and written in the Shamayim tablets, i.e. Yitzach, and that when we returned to her at a set time, she would have conceived a son. So when he comes back, she would have already had him. And in this month, Yahuwah executed his judgments on Sodom and Gomorrah and Zeboim and all the region of the Yarden, and he burned them with fire and brimstone and destroyed them until this day, even as I have declared unto you all their works, that they are wicked and sinners exceedingly, and that they defile themselves and commit fornication in their flesh and work uncleanness on the earth. And in like manner, Yahuwah will execute judgment on all or on the places where they have done 
according to the uncleanness of the sodomites. Every place that they do this stuff, he's going to burn with fire, the same judgment. Keep that in mind when you think about the, the evil things that are being perpetrated by those in the shadow governments and whatnot. All of it was foretold. All of it is the, the end of it is foretold as well. Okay. But Lot we saved or delivered for Yahuwah remembered Abraham and sent him out from the midst of the overthrow. And he and his daughters committed sin upon the earth, such as had not been on the earth since the days of Adam until his time, for the man lay with his daughters. And behold, it was con commanded and engraved concerning all his seed on the Shamayim tablets to remove them and root them out and to execute judgment upon them like the judgment of Sodom and to leave no seed of the man on the earth on the day of condemnation. That's why he, none of his seed could be accepted in into the house of Yisrael, but a daughter of Lot in the form of Ruth the Moabitess was able to not only be in covenant, but to be in the line of the genealogy of our Mashiach. But for more information on that in particular, on how the males were rejected, but the females were allowed in, you can see what is written concerning it in the book of Gad the seer. I believe it's chapter four, three or four. Might be chapter three. But moving on, it says, and in this month, okay, in the fourth month, Abraham moved from Hebron and departed and dwelt between Kadesh and Shore in the mountains of Gerar. And in the middle of the fifth month, he moved from there and dwelt at the well of the oath or Beersheba. And in the middle of the sixth month, Yahuwah visited Sarah and did unto her as he had spoken and she conceived. So she conceived in the middle of the sixth month, which nine months from then would be the middle of the third month, right? And that's important because when you compare this with the book of Luke's account of the birth of our Mashiach, it was likewise in the sixth month that Miriam was con conceived. Okay. And she bare a son in the third month, in the middle of the month, at the time of which Yahuwah had spoken to Abraham on the festival of the first fruits of the harvest, the promised seed. The covenanted one was born. Yitzhak was born. And Abraham circumcised his son on the eighth day. He was the first that was circumcised according to the covenant, which is ordained forever. And in the sixth year of the fourth week, we came to Abraham to the well of the oath, and we appeared unto him as we had told Sarah that we should return to her, and she would have conceived a son. So he after he foretold the future, he actually did what he said he would. And they returned in the seventh month and the first of the seventh month that he announced these things and he baracked them. And then Abraham keeps the feast of Sukkot or booths right here in celebration of the promised seed being with him in reality. But that's beyond the scope of what we're covering right now. However, I wanted to share with you right here. This is a type and picture that is also with this covenant. The last one that we have to mention, I don't believe we have another one, um, or we, we might have some other ones in here, which I want to cover one more. And then we, I just want to reiterate the things that we already know from the common scriptures and wrap it up. So please just one moment and we will finish things up. All right. So to continue that theme and to see that the, the line of our Mashiach was also foreshadowed and those echoes that I had mentioned before, Yitzhak being born in the 15th of the third month, the promised seed coming through Yahuda, the lawgiver, was also born on the 15th of the third month. Okay? And it's quite possible. I have that Dawid was also born on that day. Maybe other lines within the monarchy of those that were of covenant and walking in truth were born on appointed times 
you find that significance with the patriarchs as well. But aside from these references of all these times of, the, of significant events at that time with the birth of the covenant, with the birth of the line of the covenant, with the word being birthed into creation, right? The body being born again is the last culmination of that in physical form within scripture. The 15th of the third month after the death and resurrection of our Mashiach, his body born again with the renewing of the Ruach being poured out on them. And that is also alluded to with the latter rains for us in what they represent. So these appointed times are very significant because this is when he actually does things in reality. So if we want to be partakers of his benefits, we want to know the times that he keeps on them. And that's why they're very important. Ob willing, we're on the right track. And if we're not, he'll let us know. And all believers will come to the truth in him. So thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a Shavuotov or good week ahead. All right. We'll see you next time.